Okay, so this week's chapter is layout themes and HTML. So basically we're uh, customizing more than the app created with Chiny. But instead of just following along the, the content from the book, I wanted to take a little different approach. Uh, and it's similar to what was done in the previous cohort. I think it was cohort three, where they decided to delve a little more into the and uh, the HTML side of things. That is, what is the H HTML code that this R code is generating so that the app, uh, it can be visualized directly in the browser. So in, in order to do that, uh, I, I wanted to use the notes from the previous cohort, but also for time reasons, I will try to speed along the topics from the actual book. Just yes, to cover them, and then we can take a, a look at uh, what was described there in the previous cohort about HTML, CSS, and those front-end technologies that Shiny is like doing the job for us to create. So basically, <laughs> it starts by by building the site into different pages. The first kind is only one page. So this single page layout I have prepared in these examples. How does it actually look? For example, let's see. Okay, here it is. For, for page functions, we've been using explicitly the fluid page and argument to, to create our there is a mistake. I'm missing this. Okay. Um, it's, it's, so we had been using fluid page to create our sites, but now that the textbook introduces two other ways to create the app, the app, and that is the fixed page and the field page. So in this in this app, we, I simply create a paragraph and the color in that, sorry, the color of the text in such paragraph is white and has a background color of a reddish color. And this is simply the text contained in the paragraph. So if I were to run this app using the fluid page uh, function, it would do it like this. It is a paragraph and it's not occupying the whole width of the screen. As you can see, there is a small space but this function does allow us to, to fill it completely if we were to, to set that parameter. So if we were to run the same app, but now with the fixed page argument, sorry, function, it would look like this. Basically, it has established a maximum width for the page. And such width also depends on the actual width of the screen from which you are looking at the app. In this case, I'm looking at with a pretty width, a pretty big width. So there is a bunch of space uh, left out, it's planned. But if I were to reduce the screen size, it actually changes as well. And, and the last example is, if we change now field page for the user interface, and in that case, it looks like this, we can actually cover fully the width of the screen. Okay, so those are, those are the main differences. Um, now I want to take a look at the following part, that, that, it, that is to create a sidebar for the app. And its main purpose is that we can separate in our app, which are the elements that the user is going to interact with. There is the inputs and such. And on the other side of the app, we can put uh, what is actually the effect of such inputs, that is, the graphics that are getting updated or such elements. So uh, in that example, I have this app over here. Let me change uh, the, current, the current directory to the file. And the way that he does it, now first let me run the app. Okay. As I mentioned, now there is uh, like a separation in this left side, we can see there is the here is the, 
the area for the inputs. In, in this case, only one. And now to the right side is the area for the outputs. So as I were to change this value, the graphic also changes. And the basic way that he's doing that is, for example, to create this title of the app, he uses the title panel function to create now the separation between a, a column for the inputs and a column for the, for the output. He uses the sidebar layout. And to define the content of the sidebar panel, that is where we usually put the inputs, we use this function. And now the content of the, the elements that are, that, are, that are going to get updated, for example, this plot, we put that in the main panel function. That is this area, sorry, this side to the right of the page. But you can actually change it also, that the inputs are to the right and the graphics to the left, but it doesn't matter. Okay, so there is for the sidebar, but we also have a little more customization and there is to, to divide the page into rows and columns. And it also can be rows inside columns or columns inside rows. So it's quite flexible. And the app that I am going to display now is basically playing, playing around with such concept and it looks like this. I'm going to run this app, I open it. It's over here. We create two rows. In this first in column, it has a yellow color, the second red, and such. And in order to do that, we simply use, if we are using a fluid page for the user interface, then it would be over here, fluid row for one row. And inside this function, we can insert more rows or more columns. In this case, I am putting it a column. And this number four denotes that I want to occupy, I want this column to occupy four twelfths, this, this over here, of the available space, the available width. So like assert, right? This yellow is a third of my screen width. And then we can put another column. And now as I put them the first input, the number eight, that is to occupy eight twelfths of the of the width, and as you can see, right, four plus eight is twelve. So we're covering we're covering the whole width of the screen. And similarly, similarly, similarly here, where after using this function, we create another row, but now we set the width to be different sizes, right, six twelve. So that is exactly the height, the space of the of the screen. Okay, so that's for the part of uh, single pages apps created with chain. Now I'm going to go to the second section, uh, creating multiple pages. Is there any comment or questions up to this point? Okay, so then I'll move along. In this part, okay. First, I will, I will mention the use of tab sets. This is the app, so I will simply run it now. Okay, so run the app and open it. Um, what they mean by tab sets are these elements that as I click into them, we are shown like almost a different page. It isn't really a different page. This whole multiple pages app is an illusion. It's actually one page. But the content is getting hidden or shown depending on of, of which tab you're in. In this case, if I click in tab two, we show the content of tab two and the rest is hidden. And similarly for tab three and such. So basically the way to create those panels, or sorry, this, uh, this bar of tab sets, these elements is with the tab set panel function. And now these individual tabs, we create with that tab panel, and then you simply specify the title for that tab panel. In this case, it's upload data, as you can see over here. And then you simply put in the content for that panel, what it's going to show the user. And similarly now for the other panels. 
the title and then the content. So that's one way to create illusion of multiple pages. Now for the second lab, he, sorry, the author mentions, now maybe not create this illusion of multiple pages via tabs, but with a navigation bar. And he provides two examples. The first one is this navigation list. Okay, sorry, I had to change the directory first. Okay, now I run this up and it looks like this. Now we have created a navigation list and there is this element on the, on the left. And now these things, these elements, let's say panel one, panel two, panel three, they work like the previous case in the previous app. I click into them and they change the content that is going to be, that is being displayed in the page. So it's very similar to the other case, the previous one. Simply to create this panel on the left, we use that Naples panel function. We set an ID. And now when we simply input strings parameter into these functions, these are uh, interpret, interpreted as, as headers. So like sections of the page. In this case, header one via this via this the screen and now into inside this section we can now put the content for that section and in that case first I put uh, that panel this one over here and similarly to the other case you simply define its title and then the content for that panel now as, as you are to as you are going to input a more strings into this Laplace panel function. There are simply uh, like new headers for the nap list. So if this was created, header two with this string. And similarly, after that string, you can input these tab panels to denote different sections of the page that get it, that get activated or, or shown or hidden as you click into them. But the other way to to create a navigation tool for the page is not just this list on the left, but perhaps a uh, one that it, it is more common to find in the websites that one usually navigates on its own. And this is via a horizontal navbar page, sorry, a horizontal navbar. And in this case, it looks like this. Okay, now it's a window system. So let me change the directory. Okay. So this is the app for when the navigation page is horizontal. Sorry, the navigation bar is horizontal. And it's like a free version of the one that we saw earlier. You define the title. You can see over here. And then the, the panels that compose such a navigation uh, component. Panel one, panel two. Really, really the difference is uh, this now sub panel that as you click into it, you can you can navigate other sub panels that are in a sense are contained via this sub panel, like subsections of this panel over here that I am clicking. And you do that simply via this function, the number menu function. So really that's it for the, how to create the illusion of multiple pages. Because it's really simply toggling the visibility, sorry, the display of what is being shown or, or sorry, or what is being hidden to you in the, in the browser. So the last section that the book covers is about seeming your app. And basically they use the bootstrap, well, it's a framework, but we can think of it as a library. Um, it's, it's a library for CSS, that is for styling websites. It's not from now, it's actually created by Twitter. And um, the, the way that we can use it is via the BSD package. So 
in this case, we have seen, let me open this up again. We have seen an, an app where we had an interactive histogram. So really what follows is simply uh, ways to style such app. This was the app. And now I, I'm the next app that I'm going to show, it's really the same, but the, the histogram now I'm going to, to, to create it via ggplot. So I can use it then as an example of the last part of this section where they talk about customizing not only the elements of the page, like the inputs and such, but also the graphics. So the, the actual app looks like this. It's very similar to this one, but it's actually over here. Let me close the other app. This is how it looks. Well, I already put this in, and um, I don't want to put this yet. And let's play it later. Okay. I, I, I run it again. I had, uh, well, I spoiled a, a little part of it. So now, yeah, it was, it's like the other app, but simply the, the histogram is created via ggplot. So, okay, so. The idea of this section is to use Bootstrap, that is these collections of stylings that you can apply to elements of the page. And, and the way that we do this is via the VSLib R library. Um, in this case, for example, we can apply a whole theme to the website. So that is a set of changes to the style of the website elements. And we simply do that be a setting to fluid page what is its theme and we can use we can borrow that theme using the bs theme function from the bs library and in this case we're using a, a template from bootstrap and that is called darkly so as, as happened before now that we have set this custom theme sorry it's not custom this template from bootstrap now the app looks like this. And there are ways to, sorry, there are other templates as well. We can, for example, we can look at, we can look at which of those templates exist via this. And those are, maybe it runs over here. Yes, it was those those templates are through and Cosman Search. So really like pick pick uh, anyone. I pick uh, vapor because it's kind of vapor wavy that style. It. And you simply change it into this uh, this template for the same. And now well I have to load the app, sorry to run the app again. So it, it looks now like this. Mm -hmm. uh, and as you can see, despite the, the website changing its style, the actual graphics created by R, they, they, those haven't changed. So in order to fix that, after you have used some bootstrap scene, uh, you can use the semantic shiny function from the semantic library. And you input this, sorry, you insert this code into the server, and that is going to take care of the necessary changes so that the graphics have a similar style to what you apply to the website. In this case, we apply the style of this vapor template. Now, if I were to, to run the app again, as I have done now, it should update, but I think it doesn't work with this code. Yes, it says over here. It doesn't work. But to see how it would look if it did work, and we can run it simply from our studio, the same application. So now it looks like this. Let's see, let me open it. Hold. 
up from what is it? Can give me a pen search application. No. Okay, so it's the same file, same application. I would, now I simply run it from, from our studio and it does work now. I will be opening it in the browser. So the graphics should have been updated. If not, I know it's okay. It didn't work. So, so, so far, that's the only problem I have seen working with our MBS code of using our tool. Sometimes this kind of, not, not error, but limitations arise. Okay, so the graphic got the pain. So now I don't need Terra Studio anymore. Maybe. So now the last part of the book is we have set now uh, a template for the styling of the page, but perhaps we want to modify some specific elements. We want to customize it even more. And um, well, of course you can do that via CSS. That is the the the, the root, sorry the the fundamental language to style a website. But there is also another way to do it with the BSDP library. And there is that is to to use the how is it called? Yes, in preview, I think it's called. Okay, I don't, I don't remember. I don't remember the, the actual name, but the main idea is as follows. First, uh, this is basically the same app as I had shown before, but now in this case, I will simply. Uh, customize it interactively, and then I will input those changes into the app by, via the BSD package. So in this case, only similarly, sorry, only similar. Um, I I'm not going to run this because it's going to it's it's not going to work with this code. Okay, so over here I'm simply going to set the theme. Not to the template that we had before, the darkly or the vapor template, but now to a custom one. In this case, we're simply using version five of, of Bootstrap. We are setting, for example, the color for the background, the color for the foreground, and the uh, font for the text in the page. So we specify this theme, and now we use such theme for the actual app application. So now I run this app. Um, the changes that are, let's see, this one's over here should be applied. For example, bluish background. Uh, sorry, something weird happened. Uh, again, I spoiled the scene. Uh, let me see. It should be, it should work right now. Now I run again the app without the spoiler. And uh, let's see, I open it. What? Okay, this is getting a weird. It, it shouldn't be using the vapor. Uh, I will run it again. Perhaps if there is a mix up of the variables. So I will simply reload the R console. And now I run the app. Okay. And it should have this. Wait. Wait. No, no, it's okay. Now it has this bluish background that I had said before. So now this section of the this is a book covers to the interactive customization of the page, sorry, of the app. So now we can set more parameters for the scene, not just the background and such. And we can do that using the bscmer function from bslip. We simply input this code into the server function. 
And now that I reload the app, it, it should show uh, an interactive uh, CSS, what's the spelling? An interactive modifier for the style of the page. So for example, we have a default scene, so maybe let's change it to, I don't know, Lumen. And now it, it will apply the changes. And not only does it apply it, sorry, apply them, but also the changes that we use, it is going to show us uh, which were those changes. Uh, it will show us that here in the console. In this case, well, well I only set the theme, so really this thing over here, BST update. This parameter both watch equal lumen is what we could have used over here to get now the app that we are looking at. If now I change another parameter, let's see, for example, the color of the foreground. And it would it will not only apply the change to the app, but it will show us what is the change that I should input in the custom scene that we are building. In this case, it's this part, FG equals such color, that I think it's right. So I would change the first over here. And then run it in the app. No, wait, where is the save left? Ah, I changed this. Um, this one over here. But that's, that's an idea, you go change, you change the parameters uh, one by one, and then it gives you the code that, that you know, that you need to use for the sim that you are building. You simply replace it. Okay, so I over here, for example, it has used all of the changes that I made for this app. They are over here. You will simply replace this into the code for the team, sorry, the parameters for the team. Uh, and that's really it for the for this section of the book. Uh, I want to look at now if there is time, there is a little bit of time uh, to take the approach of uh, the- I have a question, sorry. Yes. Um, the theme customizer that you were using, is that specifically for VS Code or how do you get that? I don't know, it's for R, you can use it really everything I, I used over here, it also works in our studio. You download the VSLib library. I will, I didn't really put it over here, but it's over here. We're simply using the VSLib package. So the customizer that you mentioned, it's this R function. Okay, thank you. Okay, so now let me close this up. We'll take a look at, at the, the, the notes from the previous cohort. And the main idea is to understand a little bit more of, no, there is a comment. Yes. Uh, now, uh, as I was saying, the idea is to understand a little bit more what is R doing or what is Shiny doing when we create, for example, these types of elements for the, for the user interface. And, and the main idea will be to actually take a look at such HTML code, that is the code to create the content of a website and, and how it translates from HTML to R. So let's see if there is enough time, but I will try to make it work. Ah, uh, well, the, the book also mentions these types of resources. Um, if you want to learn more about front-end, that is the, the part of web development where, where you work with what the user is seeing, for example, what we are looking now at my screen, then these are web resources from Mozilla. Um, and about this book, Outstanding User Interfaces, where they delve more into this front-end area, there is HTML, that defines the content of a website, CSS that defines the styling of a website, and JavaScript that defines, sorry, that works for the interactivity of our website, how you can work with such tools uh, and with Shiny at the same time. 
uh, and as I was saying, this book is uh, it's going to get a new cohort, I think it's two weeks. So if you're interested, maybe sign up. Uh, and now I will follow with the notes. Let's see. I, I won't try to cover the whole thing because there's really not much time. So I want to take a look at the most important part. Over here, for example, uh, for the code of an application, sorry, of a website, the code actually looks something like this. We have these elements that are surrounded by these minor, sorry, less than or greater than signs. And these are actually the elements of the page, the HTML element, the head element, where you put the metadata for the site or the dependencies, like what, I, what libraries do you need, uh, and the body of the of the page. That is actually the content that we see as a user using the browser web. So now how does the R code translate to this website code that's called that is HTML. And they provide here an example, for example, for the fluid page function that we have been we have been using to to create the the applications. It, it generates some HTML in this form. For example, we simply run the function and now we get code as you read. Got a skirt. Okay. Now we have to see what is the HTML element that is being created by, by this function, by this shiny function. And this is the element. It has also the form that we have seen for the HTML code. There is this element surrounded by the less or, or greater than signs. It's creating this container for the content of our, web, of our website. And if you want to see, let's see. Now, the whole page that it is creating, there is a whole, all of the HTML code that this shiny function is creating. We can use this. All of this, uh, well, let's call it website code or HTML code, is what is being given to us thanks to this function. It's defined it, defining which of the dependencies for the for the app and which what is what is the content that the, that the user is going to see. That is, uh, what is the content over over here in, in the body of the website. And now, let's see what more do they cover. Yeah, so for example, in a more complete way, how does it translate uh, the, the input functions that we have been using? For example, this text input and then its ID and its label. What's the actual HTML code that Shiny is generating from this function? Well, now that they show the, the code generated by this, we can see that it's HTML code or it's HTML equivalent. It's actually the one over here. From one function called via using R, we are actually getting the content we need for the website. As you can see, you have an input of name in its HTML equivalent, you have also the name ID for the input and the label that you said, what is your name? It's also over here. And let's see over here, the value of the label of this input. So in a way, Shiny is doing a lot of the, of the work for us to create the HTML codes via very simple functions. Also, if you would want to write directly the HTML code, you can do it via this function from the HTML, HTML tools package. And um, we'll simply look like this. 
you you code it with a string. Um, let's see. Now about the part of the CSS that is uh, about how do you define the styling of the of the website? Um, now in this case, it's really not that interesting. Let's see the following parts. Okay, so they they delve a little bit more into Bootstrap. Um, as I mentioned, it's basically a, a collection of templates. So if you want to use some particular styling, not only for the whole site, but maybe for a button or for a column of your page, you can use those templates from the Bootstrap library. Um, in particular, it, it works something like this. You simply define to an HTML element its class. And this class, what it does, it provides that element, which are the styling rules that you want. For example, which are which is the color that you want for that element, which it is, with font size and such. It works something like this. Let's see, boots one. Sorry, boots. You have your HTML element, and you define the class to that element. A class is uh, this, these things that we are looking at, that is a dot followed by a, by some text. Um, for example, some of the changes <coughs> that it allows us to do, to do is something like this. For example, there was another thing. No, I, I expected the previous issue. Well, it is that if you have a button, then it would simply look like the usual gray scene that we are accustomed to. But if to that button element, you define right the class, this class that is being provided to you via bootstrap, that is this one over here, then, but only by defining this parameter, this first parameter of the button, it would take care of which are the changes that are going to apply visually to such element. And in this case, the preview would have shown that now the button is red. Um, I think that the text is a little bit more bold out, so it's more emphasized. But that's the main idea. You use, you use classes, that is these parameters for, em for elements to define a, a particular styling that you want for them. For example, if you want, to, if you want such element to look like this type, maybe alert type or another type that we saw over here, there are a lot. Uh, and that is uh, what they were referencing in the previous part about the using CSS. That you can, for example, here you create a header simply in Shiny, right? But now that you have applied uh, a certain class to that header, you are that you're telling the website to use some custom set of styling to that element. For example, make it really big or give it a, an underline. Do you define that in your class? Like, as you can see over here, for the my class class, they define that the changes they want for this class are simply that the color is now red. So that's the main use that. I've seen uh, use for Bootstrap, simply define an, an, an appropriate class that Bootstrap has already given you, and now define that for the element that you want in your application. Uh, well, here they deal, delve a little bit more in which are the parameters for the, the theme that we, the, for example, that we were building early on. We had seen when you can change the background color of the application, the foreground color, but the, really there are more, also the fonts. Um, now, really they mentioned what we have already done. And in this part, they go over what, what we covered in the beginning. That was the, the, type, the, the type of functions that you can use. So perhaps, 
we can take a look at, as I mentioned under the hood, at what is this HTML, this CSS that is being applied to the, to the apps that we created early on. For example, the most basic app was, well, perhaps this one, because it really, it's really basic. Okay, in the first case, we saw, let me open this up. And we simply, uh, let me use Fluid because it's more common. Okay, and we simply put a paragraph into this application. And if you want to, as I mentioned on the root, if you want to take a look at what is actually the code that is rendering in this, well, what we are actually looking this website, you can press Control U and we will, it will display it to you. This part of on, in the head is where, is where we saw that the fluid page function does for us. It includes the dependencies that we need. For example, Bootstrap. And now for the content of the, of the page, we have inserted this paragraph. And as we can see in this content, there is in the fluid, in this tip with container fluid class is actually the element that we have created. So it's really a, a back and forth between our functions from Shiny to create our content for the website. Um, perhaps now take a look to another function that we created, sorry, another app. Not okay, this one over here. Now this one, because it, this, this one has an interest case, interesting case. No, but it's actually understood better if we look first at this one. I will show this application that is simply uh, two rows and two columns. Uh, it, it, it looks like this, right? We simply color it. Now, if we take a look at what this fluid, fluid row, column, and fluid page functions are doing, that is how are, how are they generating the HTML code? It looks like this, right? We press Control U, at least in, in Chrome. And if we can see the content, the content for the website that is, is being shown as, as follows, right? Fluid page gets converted into this container, this deep element whose CSS class is container fluid. And then fluid row gets converted into this deep element with row class. And the content of these elements are, or that is of this row is what it's inside this element. So it's really this part over here. First we define this column that occupies four twelfths of the site. And, and Shiny converts this code over here into this HTML code, this link over here. As you can see, it's also the same content, column one over here, also column one. But now what it is doing for us is that when we simply had to write a four to specify that we want this column to have four twelfths of the content of the width of the width, of the available width, sorry. And Shani also take care of us that to, to set this for the, for the width of the column. Now it uses this class for this row. So it converts this, only this number four to this whole text. And this whole text is really a class that is defined in Bootstrap when we look at earlier so that now that you have set this particular class to this deep element, now its width will be, will be four twelfths of the available width of its parent, that is of this row. So it's really um, like a translation. Column turns into this, sorry, we call in this class, the four turns into this. And, and that's basically it for what 
these columns are and fluid rows are getting from are getting converted to. So now I wanted to show this one before the sidebar app because now that we know that these columns and rows in the shine it's shiny code it's getting inter interpreted so it's getting converted into HTML via this form deep elements whose class is for example row or a column with a certain width. Now if we if we take a look at the at the example of the sidebar, then the same pattern emerges despite in this code there really there is really no fluid row or column function being used. But now I run this application. Let me change the working directory. And now that I run this app and again look at this code, that we could do, for example, by right clicking on the website and clicking, sorry, and clicking on inspection. Well, inspection app, not inspect. Now it's code is over here, the HTML code for the website. But we can or we can look and we can look at it simply via present control and view. Um now at least what I found interesting that happens is that we didn't use fluid row or column for this app, but they do appear sorry, their shiny conversions into HTML, they do appear in the HTML code for the app. For example, what we have defined as, let's see. Yeah, what we can define as sidebar panel, that is a container for the inputs, is actually getting converted into this over here, this deep element that it is a column that is that it takes four twelves of the whole uh, of the whole available width. And as we can see, it's con it's it's well, it's called it's children, but really, its content of this column is this input that we have set to control this number. And similarly, sidebar panel got turned into a column, and now this section for the for the part of the app that gets updated as we interact with the inputs. In this case, it's simply the, the histogram, the graphic, this main panel. It's being converted by Shiny into this one over here. This column, sorry, this tip of class column that, that is really a column that is occupying eight twelfths of the available width. So, really, this whole thing to use different functions to define our website, they are really doing. What we have to do, what, what we did in the previous case, they are simply defining rows and columns, but they are hiding they are hiding it from us. But we can look at it in the HTML code that is being generated because it's simply the same pattern pattern that we observed before. So yeah, I think that's really it. I, I don't think I have something else to add. Thank you. Thank you so much for this um, beautiful um, discussion. So we look forward to um, our next chapter, which will be chapter seven. I guess Lydia will start preparing if she's not already prepared. Um, I want to thank you all for making this presentation possible. We look forward to meeting you guys again next week, Tuesday. Thank you so much. I think at this point we could all um, move on to various activities.